contributing writer at The Atlantic, Elliot Cohen, writes about President Biden's historic visit to Ukraine in a new piece for the magazine titled Biden Just Destroyed Putin's Last Hope. In it, Cohen writes, quote, symbols matter, a Kennedy or a Reagan at the Berlin Wall, a Churchill with a cigar and a bowler. For that matter, a green-clad Zelensky growling, I need ammunition, not a ride. Simply by taking the hazardous trip to Kyiv, Biden made a strategic move of cardinal importance. While the president clearly intended to bolster the confidence of Ukraine and the commitment of ambivalent Europeans and neo-isolationist Americans, his real audiences lay elsewhere, as his remarks about Western strength indicated. Russia has cycled through a series of theories of victory in Ukraine. It's been reduced to one last hope, that Vladimir Putin's will is stronger than Joe Biden's. And Biden just said, by deed as well as word, Oh, no, it's not. That is a gut punch to Russia's leader. The Russians received word of the trip. We are informed and presumably the threat stated or implied that they would get a violent and overwhelming response if they attempted to interfere with it, end quote. Join us now, staff writer at The Atlantic, Tom Nichols, and former spokesperson for the U.S. mission to the United Nations, Hagar Shamali. She also worked at the NSC and the Treasury Department. Good morning to you both. Um, Hagar, I'll start with you. The significance of seeing the president of the United States walk through the streets of Kiev with President Zelensky yesterday is what? Oh, you, first, the logistical feat that it takes for the White House, the military, the Secret Service to get the U.S. president to a war zone where there is no U.S. military presence is, is very significant. But the fact that they had it now a year later, uh, right before the year anniversary, and you have Biden there hugging President Zelensky, saying that the U.S. support will endure and will be here. What he's saying is that we're not going anywhere. We're going to be here until you defeat Russia. But also, when you couple that with the military support, he now announced an additional half a billion dollars in military aid, additional sanctions. What he's trying to say is, we're going to be here for you, but also we want to get to the end of this as quickly as possible. It's and, very symbolic, very impressive. And Joe, we've been talking this morning about some of the details of this trip, completely in secret. A small group of people at the White House knew it was happening. It was weeks and really months in the making. The president wanted to make this trip as he watched other world leaders walk through this streets of Kiev with Zelensky. There was a plane that was not the usual Air Force One that took him. There was a long train ride from Poland into Kiev. There was a motorcade with no sirens or lights on to get him in quietly. And then the images we just saw there of him walking confidently through the streets of Kiev with President Zelensky. Just, just a remarkable, remarkable uh, journey for Joe Biden. I mean, you, you, you read a recounting of it in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. It reads like a movie script. Mm. Uh, all, all of the diversions, all of, all of the things that, that he had to do uh, to get to Kiev and, and shake the hands of President Zelensky and walk around Zelensky and show the people of Ukraine, uh, his support for him. Uh, Tom Nichols, uh, it, it, it's probably uh, hard for us to actually be able to put into words just what that meant, uh, not only to President Zelensky, but more importantly, to the people of that war-torn country. And, and to the world. Uh, this was, you know, a president of the United States doing something that the Secret Service didn't want him to do, that people didn't expect him to do, took us all by surprise, and walked through an actual war zone. Um, uh, you know, aside from, we've just been talking about the logistics of it, um, the idea that an American president would take that personal risk um, is really something. And I think that's partly why you're seeing the outrage uh, that you're seeing from Putin, um, who doesn't go anywhere without um, being in a cocoon of guards and armored trains and cars, uh, and also here in the United States for, you know, Biden's opponents. I mean, this was, this was the Joe Biden that's not supposed to exist. This, you know, very um, um, active and vital guy um, taking on a punishing schedule. I mean, I, I got tired just think I've done, you know, some overseas trips with politicians. I, I got tired just thinking about the schedule. Um, and so, you know, Biden, I think, really surprised a lot of people on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think he's right that NATO um, has never been stronger. And it's a remarkable turnaround for an alliance that, you know, just 10 years ago was was thinking about what its what its role in the world was supposed to be. Yeah, and and you, we we have we, we need to underline this fact, Tom. Uh, you and I, both former members of the Republican Party, before I criticize uh, members of the Republican Party, 
Um, Mitch McConnell and most Republicans in the United States Senate uh, have been traditional, uh, taken at the traditional stand of Republicans. They've stood shoulder to shoulder with Joe Biden uh, in, in our defense of freedom. Uh, but you look at, like, for instance, Ron DeSantis, who actually went on Fox News yesterday and said that Putin doesn't really pose a risk to his neighbors. And uh, it just, it's absolutely painful. Uh, Eye-watering. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just, it's absolutely painful, especially a guy who wants to take control of a party that Ronald Reagan once led and went to the Brandenburg Gate and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. What, what a, what a, uh, what a way to devolve for a party. Ron DeSantis and other Republicans don't want this next election, or really anything, to be about foreign policy. It's their Achilles heel. They don't know anything about it. They don't care. The base they have to deal with um, is actively hostile to any discussion of foreign policy, partly, um, you know, as it, it is that anti Zelensky, anti Biden reflex, um, but partly because the Republicans have abandoned the the internationalist the kind of muscular internationalism that reagan brought to the end of the cold war um and adopted a kind of sour know nothingism uh, about foreign policy and those are the primary voters and this is i think why you're seeing the house being the, the house members somewhat difficult uh, more difficult than the senate members because that's the very core of the gop base that those are the primary voters that they have to get past and those voters don't want to hear anything about foreign policy or NATO or Ukraine or Zelensky because they watch a lot of TV and they don't know much more else. Yeah. Jim. Uh, Hagar, I wanted to ask you, too, you've worked so much on sanctions policy in the past in all of your different jobs. We haven't spent a lot of time recently talking about whether this could all fall apart. Uh, because remember, in the beginning, it was like, oh, countries won't come together on this. They will not do the same level of sanctions. What's your assessment looking at this on what the challenges may be for the Treasury Department, a place where you spent some time? Sure. Well, sanctions, as a rule, they take time to work. And that's the case with anything, right? When we think about Iran, for example, and when we got to those negotiations, it took years of those sanctions working, undermining their oil proceeds, bringing Iran to its knees to the negotiating table. And so with Russia, when you're talking about the advanced heavy sanctions that you have now, they've only been in place for a year. You've had sanctions since 2014. Um, you and I both worked on that when we were in government together. But they're very different now. They are very forceful. I will note that um, the Treasury Deputy Secretary Wally Adeyemo, a friend of mine, is speaking today at the Council on Foreign Relations where he will talk about the latest in the effect of sanctions. What I've seen is that he will be saying that our, due to sanctions, the U.S. and from the West, Nine th Russia has lost 9,000 pieces of military equipment. 50% of their tanks are down. So there is a real cause and effect here when it comes to sanctions. But as a rule, and this is the case for everything, sanctions are one piece of a foreign policy strategy. They're not the silver bullet in achieving a national security objective. They work when coupled with diplomatic efforts, military efforts, humanitarian efforts, whatever it might be. And in this case, and given especially Biden's announcement in Ukraine to expect additional sanctions against Russia sanctions evaders and other elements that support its military, I would expect all of that to ramp up even further this year.